Okay, thank you. I'm speaking on Dr. Doug Wampum, who had just placed there because the elders asked me always to speak on it. It dries the tears. It's just curious. So I'm going to talk to everybody today. I'm sorry, um, my lungs are bad, so I can't really protect my voice very well. So if you can't hear, wave your arms around and drum come and fix it. But um, I wanted to talk about one of the problems with banning knowledge, and that's that it allows, allows lying by omission to start happening. People kind of suggested that, but they haven't really quite gotten to it. So I thought I would use the example of the American Revolution because most students think they kind of got a handle on that one. And you'd be surprised when you know that. So we'll look at what lying mission, lying by mission is. I'll take a couple examples from the American Revolution, Royal Proclamation of 1763, the Mansfield Decision of 1772, and then we'll consider the impact on overall understanding of results. And I think it's a really good example of what happens when you just don't find out about things because nobody's talking. Okay, lying by omission, that's a regular phrase, I didn't make it up, but what it allows is a sort of strategic amnesia that envelops the speaker. Now, the speaker kind of knows it's there, but kind of feels queasy about it because it doesn't make them look good. And you probably have had some experience with that when you were like six and your brother was seven and you did something mean to him and your mom asked and you said, oh, oh I didn't do anything. You have strategic amnesia and you lied by omission because you did do, do something to him. And we know you did, but you're not talking. So when you leave something really important out, I didn't put a bug in his um, you just significantly change the picture of what's happening, and you're kind of making him up to be a liar. When in fact, you're just CBA. I'm sure you all know what that means. Well, you're creating a false impression of what happened, quite on purpose, because you don't want your mom going to put a bug in his room. So, another thing that it does is it will coddle. Preconceptions. The preconception in you is a really good girl. Okay, except when you put bugs in your brother's hamburger. So you're coddling this preconception your mom or your relatives have about you, and you're putting off that, and your brother gets the worst of it. So, lying by remission can actually be very hard on the people that are being omitted from the discussion. <laughs> Or the stories that are being omitted that would really change the picture. Okay, so omission, omission is going to change the picture. On the upper left, you see a, a picture that you normally see of Machu Picchu, right? The uh, top left picture there. Now, really interesting, if you look at it sideways, the version on the right, exactly the same thing, but all of a sudden, um, you see that that looks like a man's face. That's uh, probably deliberate in the American circles because you've got um, Brother Sky and Mother Earth, and so the sky is the realm of the male. It would make perfect sense to me that um, that was intentional, that that site was chosen intentionally because it already looks like a man looking up at the sky. If somebody doesn't tell you about that tradition of male sky uh, advantage, uh, you probably wouldn't think to change the picture. And if people who do know it, you know it to Jewish tradition, I'm not allowed to speak it. You're not going to find out until 1978. It was against the law for me to tell you that. It was against the law, federal law, for Native Americans to talk about their own traditions. Yeah, I know. It must be a lot. What? But you didn't know about it, did you? It also creates the you know, false impression that pulled this little cartoon I thought was really cute. He's got his little ice cream truck back there, and she's saying, Well, it's just when you said you picked me up in your company car, but I'm 
interesting with that and it's very good with something else, but that's an awesome impression. And three conceptions. I got it was funny, the man in the boardroom. Well, board, yeah, I have a number of preconceived notions I'd like to spout. In other words, cutting her off at the knees before she even starts. All right, so let's take a look at a few examples. And I couldn't resist the little photos on top. Everybody know who that guy on the left is? Uh, why don't you take a look at what's on the right? You know what's on the right? <laughs> Sam Adams. That's Samuel Adams. And he's going to, uh, you know, he was the most famous revolutionary in Europe for about 20 years. John Adams, that people, you know. It was Sam Adams who was giving all the credit and so he something like 150 um, pseudonyms that he wrote under. He ran newspapers, and at that time, all the newspapers in the colonies, colonies, text. He would write letters under just 150 different pseudonyms and cite things that Sam Adams said, and you would get published throughout. So um, he was spreading an awful lot of ideas and low reason ideas. Most of the ideas of the revolution are being articulated by Sam Adams. So he was a really, really important impetus to the American Revolution. And I find it quite strange that nobody was talking about him. Geez, I have some of the general facts that he was born. His cousin, John, was richer. He suppose it has to be said that he was strongly abolitionist. And uh, colonies wanted slavery. Uh, there are all kinds of things that reasons that he was left out of the modern telling, but he deserves to be very well remembered. All right, so let's talk about uh, one of the examples here the Royal Proclamation of 1763. Anybody heard of it? Oh, you have. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, after the uh, so called French and Indian War, uh, which was part of the Seven Years' War that France and England were having, except that the Indian parts in Portland and North America, guess who won that war? Were you usually told it was the British. Ah, it was the Indians, okay? Took down all the ports that were approaching western, west of uh, the seaboard cities. Took out all those forts, refused to allow them to be reestablished. Put the British in their place, take the French out. And so the proclamation was because the British wanted to continue the fur trade and they couldn't if they were going to continue violating the American rights to their land, which they just won from a kind of bloody war and it looked like they weren't going to do it. They were going to come through. Pontiac starts up. And it wasn't just Pontiac, it was a whole lot of people saying, you know, we will do this. You will respect our rights. So the king, George III, um, went ahead and uh, signed this little proclamation that said, oh, okay, well, I'll give you some of the terms here. There are a couple of provisions. The young settlers really, really liked settlers being the European invaders of the colony of Seaboard. And there were provisions that they really needed. Okay, the ones they liked. Was a perfect premise. The British actually set this up. They said, okay, for all our field officers and all of our enlisted guys, we're going to give you acreage, Native American acreage, for your service in the war. So, like 5,000 acres to each field officer they had, and the captains got 3,000. It went down by ranks, so the higher you rank, the more you got, until they got to private just ordinary fighters. They got 58 uh, you know, 58 was just a fair amount of land. And they were uh, usually sold their warrants, land warrants, to speculators to them so that two settlers would just decide they could go and aid in the United. So, of course, the uh, Europeans were coming. And also, don't disturb the so called hunting grounds. See the places where Indians lived in towns, colonies, not villages, towns that would be the most of the European settlements. Um, so don't don't disturb because we need the fur tree. Okay, the, the people in the colonies were getting rich on the fur tree too. 
And then there was somebody who really didn't like Michigan. Europeans are not allowed to go west of the Appalachian Mountains. You are not allowed to Indian territory. And guess what? Guess what? If any of you do violate those terms, I'm going to send in the British Army. They're going to drag you out by your hair and you will prosecute. Oh, they didn't like that one because they were quite used to just taking whatever on their feet. So, settlers, you go, hey, wait a minute. That's a really great idea. You know, we want to have a revolution. We can pay our fighters. We're not as broke as we thought. We can grab land and give it to our fighters. So, that was an idea they liked. And the second idea was let's be nice to the Indians as long as there's a fur trade. As long as we haven't killed every last animal. Okay. Beaver was down to bear survival populations. Uh, in fact, the Americans call that beaver tree of the war on beaver. It was the war on beaver. Um, and they wanted it solely, solely the rich people in Europe could have hunting hats because they made hats out of the beaver skins. Shaved out most of the birds of the other birds for the kind of them have. All right. So the uh, guys on the coastal colonies, they like those two ideas. But you can't do that to us. You can't declare Indian land off limits. You can't enforce the law against the people. Okay. So here you have the uh, proclamation of 1763, which was actually one of the some reasons for the American Revolution. I'm sure that most of you never heard of it in that context. Um, the people that have heard of it, did you hear the context of it? Why it would upset settlers and also give them bright ideas of how to a revolution? Never talk about that. Why? Because it really doesn't make a settler in the Mansfield decision of 1772, how many people? One, two, three people in third bed. Okay. This had a huge, huge impact. Um, it was a case about slavery. Decided in front of money to the British Supreme Court, the High Court. <laughs> the players. Okay, so you had um, Earl of Mansfield, who was Lord Murray. And he was like the British Chief Justice. That wasn't what they called him, he was the High Justice. But he got the summer families. And what's usually kind of left out of the telling is he he kind of was inclined toward the abolition. And there may have been a lot of reasons for that, but it's notable that he had a black niece. He had a niece of whom he was very young, who was black from the Caribbean islands. And the British had an awful lot of slave. Uh, Plantations styles. And there were a lot of children that resulted from the uh, Europeans that went over there and slaves. Apparently, she was one of them. So you have that, but he was also very concerned about the finances. What would happen if all of a sudden declared slavery could work? How much money would be lost? And he actually drew up charts of. The, um, the financial failure that would be caused by it. It's kind of like think of it uh, this way. Today, uh, especially when young people are rightly, rightly pushing for green energy and stop the fossil fuels, save the planet, all good thoughts. Now, there's a little downside of it. What happens to the world economy, which is completely based on fossil fuels and renewable resources? There's an awful lot of people who get very bored very fast, and you might be surprised how many things you don't have anymore because fossil fuels are in different feet. Um, so Murray was thinking about that in terms of slavery. How many people would go bust? What would it do to the economy of Europe as well as North America? What's going to happen? And he ran those charts, and he knew exactly how many people were going to be going. So he was concerned about that too. Now you have James Somerset. Explore over. 
he was an uh, educated man. He was taken uh, to Virginia via the uh, West Indies, I think. He wound up enslaved by a man uh, named Charles Stewart, the next guy over. And Charles Stewart decided he was going to take a slave with him when he went to London to transact the business. So he took James Somerset, who was, as I said, an educated man. Now, Somerset gets to London. And he finds there's an abolitionist um, community there, you know, it's cool, it's kind of nice. And he makes friends with a lot of the abolitionists. It's time for Stuart there to go back home. And he tells James, well, back your thing, you want to go back to Virginia. And James says, no, not going, not going. Stay here and I'm going to be free. And Charles Stewart says, oh, no, you don't. And so he paid a captain of the ship that he was going to leave on to kidnap Stu uh, Somerset, throw him in a dark hole, not tell anybody he was there, and then just sail back with uh, Somerset in chains and he couldn't do anything with himself. But Stuart uh, did not calculate on all the friends that Somerset had made. And so the friends started saying, hey, have we seen James lately? Nobody had, and so they started looking around. They searched and searched, and they realized that he was being held captive on that ship, which was about to say. So they ran quickly to the uh, courts uh, and demanded a habeas corpus. They said, "He can't. They can't do that. Kidnapping is against the law. You can't do that." So this case lands on the desk of Earl um, Mansfield. Longer. And he looks at it, he's going all over the way, all over the way. And so he's drawn up all these charts and he's thinking about the law and he researches British law, which going back at least 150 years, uh, had said that the heir of England is too pure for slavery. There is no slavery in England. And then the standing law for a really long time. So Somerset is correct in his argument. He had raised when he was very progressive. And um, Stewart is arguing on the other side. He's got his own kind of politics. And it comes before Murray, and Murray knows what the right thing is to do. He, he knows what the right thing is to do. But he agonized over it. And finally, the day of the decision, the hotly watched everybody is standing there and lying behind in the court of appeals. And finally, he says in the lab, he ought to teach ya. You ought to call him, which means for the heaven should fall that justice be done. Bring this way. So Somerset walked out of there being. What do you suppose that did to the minds of the OP Southern colonial slaveholders? There were hundreds of articles coming out, letters flying like crazy in the newspapers, and the slave owners were screaming and flirting. So the Mansfield decision had a big impact on the revolution that we probably haven't heard of either. First of all, the news spread like wildfire among all the colonial slaves, and they started fleeing in droves. They started running around the slavery in droves up to Canada. 15,000 of them actually made their way to England. So England suddenly has this big refugee problem. Uh, so the slaves, I think, were best things in slave spread, which didn't exist yet, by the way. <laughs> and so the slave holders screamed, you can't do this to us. They, they went berserk, I mean, berserk. Um, and it was one big one. And there are so many slave holders in the American Revolution. Think about how many there were George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, Monroe, all these guys. Patrick Henry, all these guys, William Henry, all these guys, actually it was fair as well to get. They were all big slave holders. Gee, I wonder if Mansfield has something to do with that. I don't you hear you about that. So the omissions really skew understanding of the American Revolution. All you hear about is a few good um, motives. No taxation without representation. Thank you, Sam Adams. No border. No standing up yes. and these were legitimate claims. There was nothing false about these claims. 
they had a bike on a phone up in Boston when we were in Wales. And uh, Sam had a lot of British conversations, and he was right. He was right. But, but the books don't mention the old she based words prohibition on stealing Indian land, killing Indians, a man's field decision, outlawing slavery. You never heard of those two lists of the revolution, did you? And you are too, yeah. Okay, now that changes your understanding of the revolution, doesn't it? Sure, it does. So, what is the emotional logic of lying by omission? Well, lies about the past are comforting, depending on who you're to, right? Oh, the Indians just died. No, you tell them. Oh, sleep all that. Oh, no, they weren't. Okay, so comforting past is like comfy history for a certain group that's traditionally been in power. One of the big arguments right now is that group is no longer, by 2040, no longer even be a majority in this country. And I think, you know, the reason I saw that statistic coming out of census year way back in the 1980s, I said, oh, this could be an exciting. You know, it's real choice. And I'll be less explained. But there's an emotional logic behind lies by our mission, and you don't really change it with facts. There's got to be a moral argument as far as I'm concerned. Thank you.